Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go through my uh, notes here, and I'll add and subtract stuff as needed. So, inspiration. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy three uh, sixteen to seventeen, and so. Um, so inspiration or God inspired or uh, that word it's basically God breathed and that's how it's properly translated into uh, from uh, Greek into English and so it shows us that uh, all scripture and so we're gonna look just a couple of different theories that there is right now uh, about uh, the inspiration of scriptures and so there is uh, and I put uh, NC in the end not correct so natural theory everyone is inspired by Bible writers are more inspired than the rest so the idea is this every single person living in the world is inspired by God uh, but uh, Bible writers were more inspired than everybody else and, so, uh, else and so they wrote the Bible kind of like if you have stars but you have kind of some stars that are shining a little bit brighter that's the idea behind this natural theory, that some stars start shown brighter, uh, but everybody is inspired, which is not, not correct, because only certain people are inspired by God to write the Bible. Then there is a mechanical theory. God wholly and woodenly dictated Bible to the writers. So basically the idea is, um, um, how should I put it? God basically dictated every single word to these people and they wrote it down but if you if you look uh, it's not uh, it's not how it's written a lot of it is uh, when we mention different styles we see that there has been different styles some people wrote their thoughts their ideas into uh, into scriptures and so you kind of can follow their life and you kind of see what, what what they were thinking uh, and it's not exactly just wooden mechanical. And the, and the idea is also that uh, there is people who write books uh, like mechanical writing. So what they do, they go in a trance and they kind of like write stuff. And the, the book comes from somewhere else. And they like, it's like the book already has been written. I just only wrote it down. Somebody else wrote it for me. This is not how Bible was written. The concept, uh, the content theory, or the concept theory. So that main thought of chapter or the thought of paragraph has been inspired by God, uh, which kind of is proven by what Jesus is saying. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So the idea is that. The idea given by the Bible, uh, I, I was talking with somebody and they like, I, I like what Jesus says, but only what Jesus says, Jesus' words. And so, and so just the concept that Jesus passed on, but everything else can be discarded, which is not correct. Uh, everything has been inspired by God and every single thing is important in its way. The partial theory, only, only certain parts are inspired. But as we read in Timothy, we see that it says all scripture is God breathed. And so people who argue partial theory, they kind of say this scripture is inspired, this scripture is not inspired. So this verse I accept, this verse I, do, uh, I throw away. Uh, and they kind of choose and pick, cherry pick which verses they like. And verses they don't like, they kind of throw away. Because they don't want to read those verses. Those verses might accuse them. Those verses might be uncomfortable for them. So they cherry pick. And so the problem becomes this. So, for example, if I was a follower of partial theory, I would say, these verses are important. And then if one of you were a follower of partial theory, you will say, well, these verses are actually important. They are inspired. But those verses that I say. So who decides which verses are actually inspired and which verses are not inspired so you don't really have like a general idea which verses are inspired because everybody could claim that this verse is inspired and this one is not 
uh, kind of becomes a mess. And so one of the things uh, I talked before in my sermons, uh, there was a, a book that I was given claiming the promise, and it, it was relating to uh, uh, gay homosexual agenda and um, one of the things that she attacks in that book is this verse. And she's, and she's a follower of partial theory. And she says, we don't believe that all scriptures is, is inspired. We only believe that certain parts are inspired. Uh, and you have fallacies like that afterwards. The spiritual rule only theory. Bible only inspired in faith and religious matters, but not in historical and scientific matters. Um, so, so the idea behind this is this. Stuff that relates to Christianity, stuff that relates to faith, is good. Uh, but anything that the Bible mentions historically-wise, we see different kings, uh, we see different places, like geographical places. We even see some scientific facts mentioned in the Bible could be discarded because they are not correct. Uh, too. Uh, they are not. They are not correct. They are. Uh, they are. They are wrong, and uh, they are wrong and could be discarded. But then uh, it presents a problem because what, what happens? Uh, what happens if pastor has to preach about some some uh, marriage, for example, abortion? How how does that go? Yeah. So, so basically, another incorrect theory. So there's a bunch of different ones. And look what Jesus says. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How, when will, uh, how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? This is John 3, uh, 3 12. Um, so, uh, go grab your binder over here. No, there's two sheets. No, 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 no. This way. Mm-hmm. All they come together? Yes. Oh, oh I didn't need it. sheet. Oh boy. Okay, I I have a sticky note. Okay, so make a note saying take two. Okay. So uh, if I spoke to you to, of earthly things and you do not do not and you do not believe I can't read, how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? So Jesus spoken to people about earthly things. If you did, if you listen to his parables, a lot of times he used uh, earthly illustrations, things that we see as people. And then, uh, and then he says, and then he also spoken of uh, heavenly things as well. Uh, that about the other world that we don't know much about, except from what we read in the Bible. And then the final theory. The planar ro- pl- planary verbal theory, which is uh, the correct one, uh, all planary, the words, verbal, are inspired by God. So every the entire book is inspired by God. Uh, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from mouth of God. And as we read before in Timothy, all scripture is is God breathed and useful for teaching? Everything is useful for teaching. Everything is useful for review. Everything is useful for correcting and training in righteousness. Uh, so that's just a couple of theories about inspiration that people have and uh, how to view them. So once you meet them, you will kind of know where these people are coming from, what they are preaching, and what their ideas behind behind the theories, how they uh, how they interpret the Bible. Implicational inspiration. So, a couple implications. Yes. Okay. So, so B is this mechanical theory. So, basically, the person sat down. Let's say Isaiah, right? And God wrote, uh, dictated to Isaiah, word into word, what to write. Right, so God said, Isaiah, you're gonna write this, this, this. But if you read, for example, Isaiah, uh, even chapter six, uh, which I recently preached, it says, 
in the, in the year that King Isaiah died, I also saw the Lord who was sitting on the throne. So Isaiah is writing. How is he writing? He's saying what he saw. He's like, okay, this year in the king that uh, King Isaiah died. So he's writing, oh, this was the year when King Isaiah died. And this is what happened during that year. I also saw the Lord and I saw the cherubims and I saw the glory of, the, of God. He, and then he says, and after I saw that, I said, uh, woe unto me because I am uh, I'm a man of unclean clean lips and I live among the people of unclean lips. So he's describing what happened to him. God did not dictate to him, okay, Isaiah, you're going to write in the year that King Isaiah died, this is what you saw. No. But he just explains what he saw. Now, did God's Spirit uh, work in Isaiah to actually write that? Yes. God's Spirit kind of like uh, showed Isaiah, okay, this is what you have to write. Maybe there's some stuff that he omitted, that he did not write, that he saw. For example, uh, if you read Revelation, John says that the seven thunders spoke something. And he's like, I was about to write what the seven thunders spoke. But, uh, but the angel said, you should, not, you should hide those things and not write them. Right? So he heard something, something fairly important that God prevented him from writing down. Because the God did not want us to know those things that the seven thunders spoke. You see? So that's, that's how it's different. So implication or inspiration. Not all teachings that are part of the Bible are equally important, just equally inspired. So what does that mean? So we're going to take an example, and I wrote an example here. So we're going to take Judges 3.16, and we're going to read Judges 3.16. And Judges 3.16 says this. Uh, now... Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a foot and a half long, which he strapped to his right tight under his clothing. And the second part, the second verse, is John 3.16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life right so you see the two places which one is more important than the other one john three sixteen. it's basically like a mini gospel in one verse it literally is mini gospel in one verse it takes the entire gospels condenses into one sentence and places it in one verse uh are both of those places inspired a hundred percent they are inspired but uh John 3.16 is much more important than, than, the, uh, than this place, even though the other place about uh, what Ehud did with his little uh, dagger is inspired as well. You see the difference? Did I make it completely clear? I hope so. So you guys don't say that I'm teaching that uh, the Bible is not important. I'm just saying that some places are more important than the others. Uh, even though they are 100% inspired by God. In inspiration does not allow for false teaching, but it does record a life of, some, of somebody. So let's say, and I wrote Genesis 3, 4, and uh, it's a serpent talking to Eve, and he says, you will, not, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. You see what happens? Uh, Inspiration uh, the, does not uh, does not allow for false teaching, but it does record lies of the devil. It records lies of other people. It records some other bad things that happen. Um, no, no, this one. Uh, maybe you know. <laughs> Uh, inspiration does not permit any historical, scientific, or prophetic errors. Um, so a lot of times, there is a story. There is a story which I've been trying to. Uh, I've been trying to get this document, 
there's a story that in 1861, uh, I believe it was French Academy of Sciences, published a uh, document of 50, 50 scientific uh, truths that disproved the Bible. And uh, right now, all of those things are no longer accepted by scientists because they changed. And I've been trying to track that document down and nobody seems to have that. And uh, I've been looking even uh, with some people that they look at the French Academy of Sciences website, they have a digitized format of uh, the documents and they can't find it. So maybe one of these days I'll find it, but this is just a story floating around. Uh, but there have been many, many scientists who've been trying to uh, disprove the Bible, saying that this scientific fact or this scientific scientific fact it does not correlate with what the Bible teaches. But we keep coming back that the Bible is actually uh, truthful in all the scientific references there it makes. So, for example, what did people believe? People believed that Earth was flat, right? Um, and then if you if you go to the edge, you'll fall off the fall off the egg. Uh, before you go, take a sheet, pass it to him. Mm. Um, but Bible says that God set it, set it over the, uh, the circle of the earth. Bible already showed us that earth was round, but scientists believed otherwise, and they were like, what is this book talking about? And then once we actually reached a certain point of science, we will discover, hey, hey, this earth is actually round. You don't fall off the cliff or don't fall off the edge of the planet once you reach it. Okay, so I kind of mentioned it in uh, point B, mechanical theory. Does not overwhelm the personality of human authors. No trance like writing. So many people go into trances and, and uh, once I, well, I was researching, uh, when I was researching uh, Galactic, Galactic Federation of Light. One of the, one of the how, uh, things that Galactic Federation of Light talks uh, or does is a lot of trance-like writing. And they do trance-like things that they, uh, the pe person fills up with the trance and they start talking stuff, right? And the way that that works, it's kind of weird. Uh, you, see, you see the, me well, the medium or wherever, they suddenly they change and uh, somebody else starts speaking to them and they would do they would do a couple of these changes during a session they would do like one thing comes in goes out comes in so different things comes in goes out comes in goes out and they answer different questions they uh, they bring different ideas uh, they say okay this is what you have to do or this is what you have to do and they also do a lot of trance like writing so they go into trance and they start writing stuff like this so so quickly and like it's already prepared the medium is not thinking it's already there wherever is writing through him that's not how uh, inspiration works uh, does not in exclude pictorial or symbolic language so there is symbolic language and uh, the place that I put in here Psalm 91 and 4 and we're just going to read that He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. So, is this place teaches us that God has feathers? Is he like a bird? No, it's a symbolic place. Uh, it's just telling us that God, uh, it, it kind of refers, it's kind of refers to... Uh, <laughs> I told you that this sign doesn't help. There's a song. Grab it. Which one are you going to take? You need to take this one. Take two. Okay. So, so what it, what it kind of refers to, uh, you know, like if you have, uh, if you have a chicken. And sometimes, if you guys lived in the village, I did. 
the chicken would she would open her wings and she would take her little ones underneath the wings and hide them and so they would sometimes they would stick their head out and stuff so this is this is the general idea behind this that god will protect us the mother is protecting her her little chickens and and so uh, so that's that's the ideas that's the idea behind this uh i think people people who read this at that time they completely understood they correlated this verse with what they saw daily and so for them it was very uh for them it was very uh realistic they're like oh wow this is what he means when he says this god will hide me and so somebody mentioned uh, they were translating the bible and i remember which language but uh these people had no concept of bread they didn't really use bread and so when jesus says i am bread of life they were thinking how do we translate this properly for these people to understand and so how they translate this is uh these people use fish a lot fish was their most important uh food that they had and so they translated i am the fish of life and so for these people it was like oh this is what he means when he says that this is the important food that we use for people at that time bread was important does not mean that there is uniformity in all details describing the same event and so what we're going to do is just read uh, those four places that i wrote down mark 27 37 um, no, Matthew 27, 37. Two. Matthew 27, 37. Okay, so 27, 37. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark 15. Mark 15 and uh, 26. Uh, the written notice of the charge against him read the king of the Jews Luke 23 38 38 there was a written notice about him which read this is the king of the Jews and John uh, 19 19 Pilate had uh, notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So, most likely, from if you combine those places together, what was written is, this is Jesus, King, uh, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So, some people wrote, uh, some of the uh, writers wrote, King of the Jews, Jesus of Nazareth. You see, they wrote the same idea, but they only chose like part of the writing that was about it. So there's no, not a you complete 100% uniformity because if I describe an event and some one of you saw the same event, you will describe it maybe a little bit different. Most of the details will be the same, but I would put an uh, I would put a as an accent on on something that is important for me. You know, like I would say, okay, this is more important, more important to me, and I'll put more detail in that. One of you would put more detail into something else, which is more important to you. So that's the idea behind that. God included everything that He wanted us to know and exclude everything else. And I think this is one of the most important things. Because a lot of people say, why doesn't Bible talk about this or that or this other thing? But God knew what was important for us, what he, we needed to know, and so he included those things. Rest, he excluded. We don't need to know. We will know one of these days. But at this point, we don't need that. Basically, you can say that Bible is a basic manual for salvation, if you want to put it that way. It's not a science book. It's not a book on um, health or something like that. It's, it is a basic manual. How could I, as a human being, be saved? 
from my sin. Okay, so can we? Uh, officially accepted as authoritative scripture. And the reason for the need of kind of is emergence of many religious books among the Jewish believers and later among Christian co Christians converted from Christianity. These books also claim to be inspired by God. And one thing I included here is Bible is not authorized collection of books, but rather a collection of authorized book, books. So these books were accepted by everybody as being uh, inspired by God and then they were collected into one book they were, they were accepted as being inspired before they were collected into the Bible church uh, did not uh, make these books inspired God made these books inspired and so the church has just collected these books and uh, came up with uh, with uh, a can canonical scriptures and the reason why uh, the primary reason there was a uh, there was a guy in Rome and I forgot his name started with an M and he uh, he collected a bunch of scriptures uh, some parts of gospel couple of uh, epistles and couple of these other gnostical books and he put it together and he said this is only books that you're supposed to be uh, uh, living by and he was a very heretical teacher uh, during uh, Roman times and I forgot his name is something that you know, and I didn't include it so which books came into canon there was a couple of uh, criteria that the book had to meet authorship so who wrote the book who was behind the book who and uh, they some books they were debate, debated on for a long time before they were actually accepted as being uh, as as being canon. Local church acceptance was it read in churches? How did <coughs> Christians of old perceive these books? Did they consider them to be inspired by God? Did they actually read them, or did they discard them? So I mentioned Diocletian, uh, the Roman. Uh, Uh, whatever his the Roman ruler who who built that column it said that now there's the uh, name of Christian has been wiped out or something like that uh, it, it's in the other lecture one of the things that the church did so because he said uh, he said that uh, they had to bring all the Bibles so they would burn them and so so the early Christians, they brought a lot of these, these Gnostic Gospels, and they brought it to them and said, hey, here's our uh, Gospels. And they burned them because they couldn't distinguish what was actual uh, good Gospels and what which, uh, which was Gnostic. So a lot of Gnostic material was destroyed during that time as well. Church Father Recognition. Did they accept the book or epistle? So not only uh, the church, if the church accepted the book or the epistle, did the church fathers, people like Augustus, uh, I mean uh, Augustine, people um, and other people during that time, did they actually accept these books? A Polycarp and, and, and others, uh, what did they say about the books? Because a lot, of, a lot of those church fathers actually spoke out against some books. They did not consider them to be God-inspired. Book content, what did the book teach? Did it contradict other books? So, but once we look at some of these other uh, gospels, we will see that some of the stuff that they teach, they actually did contra contradict what the Bible taught. So they would have like weird ideas, and I think uh, later I'll I'll uh, mention some of that stuff. But uh, it actually directly contra contradicted uh, the Bible, and so they were discarded and personal edification, ability to inspire, convict, and edify church of believers. Was there something that actually edified people who would listen to this book? Or was just like Book of Mormon, for example. It's so full of uh, just fluff. This guy just keeps on going on the rant. And, you know, you read it and you're falling asleep because it's so boring. It's literally a boring book. Um, 
Final canon was declared in AD uh, 397 by Third Council of Carthage. Old Testament canon was, uh, was finalized by uh, Ezra and other, and other uh, teachers of the law. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Because so, I wrote so much data. Uh, and by Ezra and other other teachers of law around uh, 400 BC, so Old Testament was already complete by that time. So favorite topic, ap apocrypha books, which is uh, I think everybody's inter more interested in. Um, I did not write this in the notes, but there at least there is at least 17 Old Testament apocrypha books that belong to Old Testament. And at least 280, at this point it's even more, from New Testament books that uh, say that they are inspired by God. So um, I actually brought a book. Uh, this is a book of all sorts of apocrypha books, but doesn't even come close to including the 280 uh, because there's so many. Uh, um, apocrypha, meaning of, meaning of the word uh, literal meaning of the word is that which is hidden. It's like hidden knowledge. Many of these books have been written by agnostic authors. Books that are not included fail some of these uh, some of the tests that were mentioned before and also for the following reasons. And I conclude: contain historical or uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you said uh, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is there's Torah, right? But then there's at least 17 other books that we know of that pertain to saying that they are inspired by God. At least 17 other books. Uh, and, and the Torah is a little bit different than what our um, what our Old Testament has, because it has some couple other stuff, a couple other books. Uh, but some of this is like rabbinical writing, and uh, maybe written by Pharisees and stuff, so they, they include some of those. And I don't exactly remember the names of them either, because there's like so much. But, um, so yeah, okay. So contain historical or geographical mistakes. Contain false doctrine. Example, praying for the dead. Um, and even, um, I believe, uh, Maccab Maccabees, the book of Maccabees, is, has, uh, when, uh, okay, so the reason why our Bible does not have book first and second and third of Maccabees is because, uh, and the Catholic Bible does have that, is because what happened was this. When Luther did the revolution, uh, you know, Catholic Church prayed for the dead. And so they said, you know, like indulgences for the dead, you, you, you paid some money, and the person came from, uh, from uh, the place where they were cleansed, where I just tell I don't know what it's called, uh, Purgatory. So the, the, as soon as you paid money, the soul came from the purgatory, right? And so when Catholics were arguing against Luther, against, because Luther was against praying for the dead and Catholic were for it, they used Book of Maccabees as a support for praying for the dead because it mentions about praying for the dead. And so it was not included in our canon, but Catholic Church suddenly approved it as being a canonical book because they had to have a verse to argue against Luther for praying for the dead. So that's the reason why it got approved. Yes. Uh, Sirach, um, the reason why it was not included it is a good book. It has a lot of good uh, thoughts. It, it's it's actually a really good book, but uh, the reason the reason why it was excluded and it was excluded by the Jews themselves 
because they said that after, what's the last book? Hold on. Is it uh, Malachi? Let me look. The Jews say that after Malachi, yeah, Malachi. Malachi, God stopped speaking. So uh, God stopped speaking, and uh, so they did not include a uh, book of Sarah as a being uh, inspired gospel because it was written after uh, after Malachi and it was written in a period of the 400 years where God was silent. It was literally God was silent for those 400 years, and th that's when when that book was written. Uh, and I think there were some questionable things that he mentions there too, and so that's why it was not included. I don't, don't remember the exact words, but uh, there were some questionable things that we also discarded that book. Okay, so Kantei style is not used in any canonical books. Example, legends. The Bible doesn't really use legends, but some of these books use legends. And they don't contain they don't contain biblical character, for example, prophecy. So that's primary reasons, or some of the primary reasons why they were uh, rejected. Yes. So one of the things that they looked in, and I kind of mentioned it before, uh, personal edification, ability to inspire, convict, edify churches or believers. And they... Uh, they kind of looked at the book to see. So uh, because of this criteria, Book of Esther uh, was under question for a really long time because it does not, it does not uh, mention the name of God. And so in uh, apocryphal books, there is a part they add to Book of Esther which actually mentions the name of God and it has a prayer, prayer of uh, Mordecai and it has uh, the letter of the king, and it has something else, and I don't remember exactly why, but it actually mentions the name of God. So this addition to the book. Now, this addition has been analyzed, and they say that there, it seems like uh, some Pharisee or somebody looked at the book, and they were like, well, hold on, this book doesn't really have the name of God, so let me fill in that gap. So they kind of tried to fill in the gap. The gap. But the reason why it was accepted because it showed how God cared for his people even in difficult situations. They showed the love of God to like virtually an impossible situation to Gerardo when uh, uh, basically the entire nation turns against, turns against the Jews. But then you see God's mercy come in and save, and save the Jewish, uh, Jewish people. Yes, uh, take it away from him. Um, so that's 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 the final reason why why the book uh, was accepted in the in the end <clears throat> the it fit this uh, biblical uh, biblical character they saw the law of God displaying through this book and that's why they included it. Okay, so. So I included a couple quotations that I went to this book and uh, some other stuff. And I just wrote a couple of quotations just to show you what these books write. And I'm not going to read to you because I didn't even read the whole thing myself. I read parts and bits and pieces of it. It's a big book. It's like another Bible, honestly. Uh, so... Uh, and God looked at his maidservant Eve and delivered her, and she brought her, forth her firstborn son, and with him a daughter. <coughs> so did you know that when uh, Cain was born, he was actually born with a sister? When Adam rejoiced at Eve's deliverance and also over the children, and she bore him, and Adam ministered unto Eve in the cave until the end of eight days. Then they named the son Cain and the daughter Luluva. The meaning of Cain is hater because he hated his sister in his mother's womb. Uh, ere they came, uh, where they came our way. Uh, therefore did Adam name him Cain. But Luluva means beautiful because she was most beautiful, uh, more beautiful than her mother. 
Then, here's what happened. After uh, a little bit later, and I did not include this part. When the days of nursing the children were ended, Eve again conceived, and when her days were accomplished, she brought forth another son and daughter, and they named the son Abel and the daughter Achlia. So, there you go. Already, what we have is direct contradiction to what the Bible writes. Two, two. Uh, so, uh, right away, we have a contradiction to what the Bible writes uh, in, in, in there. Uh, there's, there was another... There's another interesting part. Let me see if I could find it. Uh, well, to, the, to this book of Adam and Eve, uh, and there I think like two or something of those, you see like all sorts of weird things happening, right? The devil keeps coming to them, and he takes different forms. And so one time he came like an old man, and he tries to lead them away. Uh, then he came, uh, then Adam was praying, and he came as a beautiful woman, and he tries to deceive Adam. He's like, hey, Eve is old. This is basically what he's saying. He's like, hey, you know, you're young, you're older, but you're still okay. Eve is like getting older and ugly. Uh, come with me, you know, basically that's, 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 that's the story. Uh, then, uh, then another thing happens. Uh, Adam and Eve commit suicide. So they jump off the cliff. They literally, literally jump off the cliff and kill themselves. But then God shows up, and uh, God brings them back to life. Uh, and I don't know where, where this. Exactly. Anybody can write. Uh, anybody can write a story. But is this story true? <laughs> Uh, where in the Bible does it mention that when uh, Cain was born, there was also a sister born with him? How about when Abel was born, there was also a sister born with him? How about uh, that Adam and Eve committed suicide? How? Wait, 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 over here. Yeah. What I'm saying is this, if you introduce this into the Bible, right, you have, you have so much material that people could be like, hold on, this, is, uh, this doesn't correlate with this. You know, you have conflicting, atheists are constantly trying to look for conflicting things in the Bible, constantly. Go on any of their websites. This, is, this conflicts with this. this. Books that were not inspired by God and they were not written by, uh, by inspiration, will create a lot of conflict. And if you include it, as, include it in, in uh, canon, you will see all sorts of con conflicts going on. Uh, then, uh, so, let me see. If you look, this is... Uh, this part of the book is Adam and Eve, and this is, uh, this is like 80 pages. So 80 pages of Adam and Eve. Uh, and all sorts, it's all sorts of, of weird stuff, and how their family was working, and, and uh, but what I'm saying is, if you see things like Cain, Cain is born with the sister right away, why this doesn't Bible mention the sister? You, you see what I'm I know, but at, at the same as at the same time, if uh, I'm just based the, the ba if you want to go off of heresy and I didn't read the whole book, I could possibly go and see what there is uh, heresy wise, but. If it contradicts, like, so it's telling a story about Adam and Eve, and it contradicts what the Bible is saying, it's already a heresy by itself. Now, uh, regarding the girls, yes, that's true. But if the second child would have been a girl, it would be mentioned. Because what you see, it's talking about the first children. So... Uh, 
you have Cain, you have Abel, then you have um, e Enoch. Yeah. So, so three sons of first people born. And then later, they, of course, they had girls. They had to marry somebody. But, uh, but if not the way that this describes, you know, here. Okay. So then we have uh, Enoch, Enoch, Book of Enoch. Probably one of the most famous books. A lot of people talk about it, but. Uh, there's book of Enoch, and I don't have it here. I only have uh, secrets of Enoch. So according to uh, according to the secrets of Enoch, he wrote all these things in his creation, which the Lord created, and wrote 366 books. So in, according to this, Enoch wrote 366 books. So uh, I just wrote two things from Book of Enoch, and then later I wrote a thing from Secrets of Enoch. And, and Sam J uh, Jaza, who was their leader, sent to them. So this is just a quotation from part of Book of Enoch, and it names Sam Jaza as the primary angel. Now, where do you, in the Bible, do you ever hear of name Sam Jaza? You hear Ar 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 Archangel Michael, right? Uh, Gabriel. And it looks like Archangel Michael is the leader of all the angels. But nowhere in the Bible it mentions Samjaza. But Enoch says that he's the leader of all the angels. And then he lists huge lists of different names uh, of other angels. And, a lot, and most of these are never mentioned. Uh, also as <coughs> leaders among the angels. But we see Gabriel and Michael uh, seems to be the leaders. And then another one. And from there I went to the ends of earth and saw great animals there and one different from the other and birds different as their appearance, their beauty and voices one different from the other. And to the east of these animals I saw ends of earth where the heavens rest and the portals of heaven open. You see the implication of this verse <coughs> from scientific point of view. What? It is saying the earth is flat, and a second thing, it says uh, where the heavens rest. So one thing there it's saying that the earth is flat. Second thing there it's saying that. There is a place on earth where there is actually heavens kind of like come down and rest on this place. So a uh, place on the earth which actually supports the heaven. Can you imagine the field day that the atheists would have with this verse? It would be like bloodbath. Because they would be like, look at this. The Bible says the earth is flat. So... This scientific fact, scientific fact, this is a scientific fallacy, one of the reasons why this book was rejected. Now, there's other weird things in that book, there's a lot. And so stuff like the heaven that it describes is like really weird. Uh, if you want to go look on the internet, but you guys don't even have time to read the Bible. Uh, and it describes very weird scientific facts, yes. Book of Enoch. 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 Uh, and a bunch of other scientific facts, scientific facts that just don't correlate with the Bible and don't, don't correlate with science. If you read it from scientific point of view today, you're like, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not correct. Like in another place, he says that uh, he saw that... Uh, so there's storage place for sun and the moon. So so during the, uh, during the night, the sun is stored in in a place, and during the day, the moon is stored in that place. And then when night comes, the moon comes out, and the sun goes back to this place. So that's the idea that he gives. That's another like uh, passage that that would that scientifically is inaccurate. So, just saying. Okay, Secrets of Enoch. Enoch. So, 22. Let me see what it says. Thus I saw the Lord's face. 
But the Lord's face was infallible, marvelous, and very awful, and very, very terrible. And there is no man that could see my face and live. Right? You see the problem here? So this guy says, well, I went to heaven, because it says that he went to 10th heaven. So... Uh, yeah, uh, on the tenth heaven, out of what I saw the appearance of the Lord's face, like iron made of, to glow in fire, and brought out a million sparks as it as and it burns. Uh, so basically, he's saying he went to tenth heaven, and then he saw the Lord's face, and he kind of says he was terrible and and marvelous and very awful and yeah, very 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 terrible. Direct contradiction. Yes, Peter. I think seven. Oh no, third. He went to third heaven. Yeah. Oh, but Enoch went to tenth heaven. So, there you go. So there's like a lot of questions, and, and, and you, if you read this, there's just a lot of weird issues that kind of don't correlate with what Bible teaches. From what, from what he's saying, it's not there. It's far, far away. It looks like he's saying that it's actually. Uh, I saw the ends of the earth where the heavens rest. So he's saying, I saw the ends of the earth where the heavens actually rest. Now, uh, now you can make an argument that maybe he looked in the distance and he saw. Uh, you know, for example, you can kind of see where the horizon. Is. Maybe that's what, what you can say. But the way he wrote it, it sounds like he's talking about a flat Earth and the heavens being rested there. But we know that no matter how far you go, the horizon. That's the same thing with Shevchenko. He went looking for the pillars that support the heaven, and he thought they were far away. And so that's what he went. He, he kept walking and couldn't find them. Okay, now if you, you want to take that out, but then, then explain the one about uh, storage place for sun, <laughs> storage place for moon. Yeah, because he's saying that they, 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 the, the sun during the, during the night, the sun's stored in that place, and then it comes, by, comes back rejuvenated. The idea, it sounds a very Egyptian-like idea where, where the, the sun Ra dies, and then comes back reju uh, again uh, uh, how is it uh, boy resurrected so yeah the sun dies during the night and then re resurrects again so that, that was the idea of G Egyptian so it's very sounds very Egyptian to me okay so uh, then the gospels the Gospel of the Birth of Mary. So there is a Gospel of the Birth of Mary. And so the idea behind this is the same. It sounds very similar to how Jesus is born. Basically, angel comes to, uh, angel comes to Mary's parents, tells them that they're going to have a girl, and they have to give her to the temple. And so they have a girl, and they give it to the temple, and then, uh, and then she grows up, and they decide... Who are they going to marry Mary to? Uh, and so they collect a bunch of guys. And let me just read this part. I wrote a little part. but Then according to this prophecy, he appointed that all the men of the house and family of David who were marriageable and not married should bring their several rods to the altar. And our wherever person's rod, after it was brought, a flower should bud forth on the top of it. The Spirit of the Lord should sit in appearance of a Tao. Uh, he should be the man who the virgin should be given to be betrothed. Among the rest, there was a, a man uh, named Joseph 
of the house and family of David and a person very far advanced in the years who drew back his rod when everyone besides presented his so that when nothing appeared agreeable to the heavenly uh, voice the high priest judged it proper to consult God again who answered that he to whom the virgin was to be betrothed was the only person on whom were, uh, were brought together who had not brought his rod Joseph, ther Joseph therefore uh, was betrayed for when he did bring his rod and a thou coming from heaven pitched upon the top of it everyone plainly saw that the virgin was to be betrothed to him so so they, they said that uh, there was a prophecy that said that uh, all these men who were not married, they should bring their rods, very similar to very similar to what they did with Aaron, and they placed their rods, and whoever rod bought it and brought forth flowers, and then also the Spirit of the Lord would say that as a doll, he should take Mary as a wife. Now we're in the Bible, we find that. That's one thing. Second thing, to me, it sounds like somebody who wants to worship Mary. You know, there's people who uh, worship Mary as as uh, being equal to Jesus, or sometimes even higher. Uh, wanted to make her appear very special, and so they wrote this entire gospel. And so, uh, so it's basically like uh, um, to. to Okay, uh, so, so basically they wrote this to, to make it appear very special. The first gospel of infancy of Jesus Christ. And another time, when the Lord Jesus was coming from home in the evening with Joseph, he met a boy who ran so hard against him that he threw him down. To whom the Lord Jesus said, As thou hast thrown me down, so thou shalt fall, fall not even rise. No. And and that moment, the boy fell down and died. And then you kind of hear that thing repeat constantly. And so people were uh, against Jesus, and he like cursed them, and they had problem. Oh, they became blind, I think. Uh, and then he did little birds that he made, and they became uh, and they became uh, actual birds from uh, from. Uh, flash I guess. so you see these things repeating but if you read that Jesus was kind of like a little murderer he was cursing people left and right if he didn't like that do you have that story from the Bible you say that, that he went back home and he was obedient to his parents you can see uh, Jesus using his uh, miracles until canon of Galilee when he turned the uh, water into wine Let me see what else we have here. Okay. And then infancy of Gospel of Thomas. Now Nina mentioned that. Uh, the other time you were talking about it, but there's infancy gospel of Thomas and then there's gospel of Thomas, so there's a couple of these. What? Uh, but uh, the same idea is kind of repeated in infancy gospel of Thomas, where Jesus kills people uh, or boys, and uh, and then Jesus, seeing what had happened, uh, said. To him, your fruit shall be without root, and your uh, you should, uh, should shall be dried up like a branch, oh, scorched by a strong wind. And instantly the child was withered, so he dried up, maybe even died. I don't know because it doesn't really specify. I don't know whether I guess he was. Uh, it's like uh, it's, I would think it's uh, paralysis. Paralysis. Do you think so? I think so. Yeah. So he. So the child became paralyzed. 
It's, it's not a pretty picture, though, this quote unquote gospel drama. And then I have uh, this other God, the Gospel of Thomas. Yes, I know. We will sing. What time did you guys came? Yes, I know. I was early here. I was story men's here before at seven thirty. So, so that's okay. We will we will finish this and we'll sing. This kind of what happens when you come late. Okay, let's see. Okay, so I've just wrote a couple things from Gospel of Thomas here, and you guys can kind of read them. I'm gonna sk skip by, but uh, Jesus said, "Blessed is the line which becomes a man when he consumes a man, and cursed is the man who the line consumes, and the line becomes a man." What does that mean? It doesn't make sense. I'm curious. Not exactly the way that Jesus that Jesus would talk. Very well then, let's go to the second one. When you make the uh, two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and about like below, and when you make the male and female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female a female, and when you fashion eyes in the place of an eye, and hand in the place of hand, and a foot in place of foot, and a likeness in place of likeness, then you will enter the kingdom. I'm curious because they didn't make sense to me. I, I was confused. It's, it's on your thing. It's uh, 22. Or, or verse uh, 114. Simon Peter said to him, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may became, become a living spirit example in humans. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know. That doesn't sound right to me, as far as I'm concerned. It kind of sounds weird. If it makes sense, I would allow an explanation. When you disrobe, when you disrobe without being ashamed, and, and take up your garments and place them under your feet like little children and tr tread on them, then will you see the Son of Living One and you will not be afraid. So basically, when you undress and you can walk naked without shame, then you will see the Son of Living One and not be afraid. If it makes sense, it makes sense, but to me it doesn't make sense. Up to you guys. Uh, and then Gospel of Judas, I just took one thing. Uh, one thing I will just point out to you, you will see how many lines are missing. It says 17 lines are missing, 15 lines are missing, and then throughout the whole Gospel of Judas, you will see multiple places it says this many lines are missing, this many lines are missing. So if it's a word of God, why is God allowing it to disappear or big parts of it disappear? Uh, so just, just another idea. And then uh, I put structure of the Bible. Old Testament has 39 books. Primary theme, Messiah is coming. And law, five books. Historical, 12 books. Poetry, five books. Major prophets, five books. Minor prophets, 12 books. New Testament, 27 books. Primary theme, Messiah came and he will return again. Gospels, four books. Historical, one book. Epistles of Apostle Paul, 14 books. General Epistles, seven books, and Revelation, one book. So that's it for uh, today. Uh, I will open the floor, floor for questions if you have any. I might, I might answer them, I might not answer them, if I don't know.